We're going to go from Romans 1 uh, through up to Romans 2. Later on, we're going to hit Romans 5. We're going to be all over Romans uh, today. I love Romans. I call Romans Paul's passion project. Uh, Paul always wanted to go to Rome, and uh, I call it his passion project. So if you're ready, say, I'm ready. I said, if you're ready, say, I'm ready. This is what Paul says in Romans chapter 1, starting at verse 18. Paul writes, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the what? Suppress the what? Suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. I want to start off this morning. We're going to pause right there. We're going to come back to Romans 1. But I want to pause right there for just a few minutes. And I want to give you a case for a creator. Look at your neighbor say, a case for a creator. A case for a creator. Maybe you're in here this morning. Maybe you're new to church. Maybe you haven't been to church in a while and you've walked in here doubting uh, whether or not God is even real, doubting whether or not He even exists. Or maybe you're walking through some things right now and you're battling with these, these thoughts of, is God even there? Does He even hear me? Well, I want to dig into just a few pieces of evidence this morning, and we could do a whole series, I mean, we could do a whole message series about all the different evidences, all the different pieces of evidence that we have for God, but I want to focus on this text, and Paul starts off in this section giving some evidence of the existence. He says in verse 19, for what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been, what? Made. So they are without excuse. And he's saying that there's evidence, there's clear evidence in all of creation that there was an intelligent creator behind it. And maybe you disagree. Maybe you think that there's no evidence. Well, I want to give you just a few pieces of evidence, and it's not limited to, this, limited to this, but I want to give you just a few pieces of evidence this morning. The first piece of evidence that we have is the Word of God itself, the Bible itself. We believe that the Bible is the inerrant, God-breathed Word. We believe it is breathed out. It's been transcribed, written physically by man, but authored by the Holy Spirit, authored by God. And not only is the Bible full of history, it is a historic book that is backed by archaeological and geological evidence. Not only is it that, but it is also a collection of books written over what we believe to be a time period of 1,500 years with nearly 40 different authors or estimated 40 different authors on three different continents, three different languages, and yet with more than 63,000 cross-references within itself. And not one contradiction. And with something being that perfect, you might begin to believe, man, this had to be inspired by a divine God. Second piece of evidence is, is this, as Paul writes, creation, the universe itself. Is it okay if I get really nerdy and really geeky for just a few minutes? Is that okay? Is that okay? There's this scientific law that we have known as cause and effect. It's not a theory, it's a law. It's the law of cause and effect. Cause and effect. And what the law of cause and effect states is that every action in the universe requires, or sorry, will produce a reaction. Every action produces a reaction, and vice versa, every effect in the universe has a cause. And it all has an original starting point. If I look at these speakers, I don't think those just appeared one day. No, no, no. I think somebody caused them. I think somebody engineered them. I think somebody then purchased them and put them on this stage. They had a cause. Something caused them to be made. And now when we're looking at the universe, you might look at the universe and say, that cause is the Big Bang. And I'm not here to debate that, but whether or not you believe in the Big Bang or not, it would have required a cause. And whatever caused it would have required a cause. 
and whatever cause, that would have required a cause. And what am I trying to say? The universe had to originate from somewhere, and there had to be some sort of uncaused cause in the beginning that caused everything. There had to be something, somebody that was not caused, but caused everything. There had to be an intelligent, divine creator because he begot perfect order. When we look at our universe, the way everything moves, everything works together, it's perfect order. Perfect order. And order does not come from chaos. Order comes from order. And you know what else? Life comes from life. You can, you can preach it all you want, but a machine will not produce a baby. Life comes from life. Life comes from life. And now the follow-up question to that argument is always, well then, where did God come from? What caused God? Nothing. No one. God is eternal. God says, I am the first and the last. I'm the alpha and the omega. I'm the beginning and the end. He did not have a beginning. He won't have an end. He is the beginning and he is the end. And we try so hard to comprehend God. You and I are confined by time, space, and matter. You and I have a beginning and we're going to have an end. And we can't fit this infinite God into our finite minds because his ways are higher than ours. His thoughts are higher than ours. And we try to understand him but he won't fit in our box. He won't fit in our box. And he's not confined to the same physical things that you and I are confined to. He didn't have a beginning. He was the beginning. Why am I saying all this? I want to show you, man, that there is evidence for a creator. And if you don't see it, it's either because you haven't looked or it's because you've refused to acknowledge the truth. Because God is very real and God is very, very present. Let's get back to Paul. Somebody say Paul. Let's get back to Paul. Now, Paul is talking about these people who suppress the truth with their unrighteousness. Then he continues on in verse 21. And this is where we're really going to spend a lot of time this morning. He says, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. We might call that idolatry. And then it says, and there's three times that Paul makes this statement, therefore God gave them, what's it say? God gave them up in the lusts of their heart to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, second time, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passions for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, number three, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful. And look at this, inventors of evil. Inventors of evil. Man, this is what we see in our world today. Not only is the world wicked and partaking all these evil things, but they're coming up with new ways to do evil. Coming up with new ways. Disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know the righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. And this was written nearly 2,000 years ago. And yet the truth and the evidence is all around us still today. And it says that God gave them up to a debased mind. Some versions say a reprobate mind. It's this wicked and corrupt mind, incapable of doing anything good. Then it continues on in chapter 2, verse 6. It says, He will render to each one according to his works. To those who practice in well-doing, who by practice, patience, sorry, in well-doing, seek for glory and honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. 
but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. Then it goes on to say, first to the Jew and also the Greek. Now I want you to notice, man, this is a truth. I feel like this is something too that we don't talk about enough. For the unrighteous, for the people who practice these things, this sin, who run after these things, they will experience judgment and they will experience the wrath and fury of God, the Word says, and they will be destroyed. Now I want you to notice there are three times that Paul says God gave them up to these things, three times. And we can debate as to whether Paul is giving us three examples or, or whether it's a linear type of effect, but either way, each time Paul says it, it is a direct response, the direct result of a failure to worship God solely. And here's what we gather. A failure to worship God will lead to your destruction. A failure to worship God will lead to your destruction. I believe the depravity of man began with a failure to worship. I want you to think about it. The fall of man, when sin entered the world in the garden, the initial entry of sin began with a question of God's truth. Did God really say? It began with a question of God's truth. It began with man trusting a created serpent over the God of creation. And a failure to honor God and follow His truths will destroy you. Now the question is, what is worship? Look at your neighbor and say, what is worship? What is worship? Worship is, is a deep reverence or adoration for the Lord. Key word, adoration. Worship is more than, than just music. You know, we get mixed up because we call this worship right here. That's worship music, but worship is more than just something we do. A worshiper is who we are. We ought to live lives of worship. We ought to live our lives to the glory of God, not just singing songs to Him on Sunday, but worshiping Him in the way that we live our lives, worshiping Him in how we spend our money, worshiping Him in how we talk to people, worshiping Him in the way that we spend our time, worshiping Him by following His teachings. Worship is not just singing and music, but it's honoring the Lord in every aspect of our lives. It's committing our entire lives to Christ. And now here's the deal. And this is the, the hard truth about worship. You and I were created to be in relationship with God. God. We were made in God's image to be in relationship with Him and to worship Him for all of eternity. We were made to worship. And because we were made to worship, we have been hardwired to worship. And if you aren't worshiping God, you're worshiping something else. If you aren't worshiping God, you're worshiping something else. When God is not on the throne of your heart, something else will take his place. And we see this truth happening today as well as all throughout Scripture. One case in particular is found in Exodus 32 when the Israelites, they hadn't seen Moses in a while, and I'm just paraphrasing. And so what did they do? They took their gold, their earrings, they melted them down, and what did they make? They made a golden calf, and they began to bow down and worship this object of creation as opposed to the Creator Himself. And they began to give this golden calf the glory as if that was what led them out of captivity. And they began to worship these idols. And it's something, it seems so ancient, but it's something that we do today because we have to worship something. And there's a reason that the first two of the Ten Commandments involve abstaining from idolatry. And you want to know why we don't melt down our gold anymore to build our idols? It's because now we can buy our idols in a store. Now we've got idols sitting at home on our entertainment centers. We have idols in our pockets or in our purses, these little screen idols. We, we can go incognito or private browsing on our cell phone and we can search our idols on a website. We were made to worship and when we don't worship God, we can so easily look in all the wrong places for something to worship and we fall into this idolatry. And we begin to give our adoration that God is worthy of, that God is seeking 
we begin to give that adoration to something else. And my question for you this morning, and I pray you search your hearts in this, my question for you is what do you worship? What do you worship? Because we were made to worship the God of the universe, yet so often we trade the worship that He deserves and we give it to counterfeits. We worship the knockoff. We worship the fake. We worship the created. And I ask you again, man, what do you worship? What are you devoted to? What stands between you and God? What wall have you built? What attack have you opened yourself up to? Maybe for you, your idol is a screen. Maybe it's a social media platform. Maybe it's a news station. You've spent so much of your time looking at these things as opposed to spending time with the Lord. Maybe your idol is, is some kind of video or, or images that you know, man, that you should not be looking at. Maybe your idol is a bottle or a drug. Or maybe, just maybe, your idol doesn't look quite so dangerous. Maybe what you have idolized doesn't look so sinful. Because here's the hard truth about idols. Idols often appear innocent in the beginning. They appear innocent in the beginning. What do I mean? The thing that has built a wall between you and God may not necessarily be a sin. It may not even be a, a bad thing, but here's the, duel, the, the deal. Every good tool can also be used as a deadly weapon. Now, I got a hammer. That can get some serious work done. And you can also use a hammer for some other stuff. And I'm not going to give you any ideas or, or descriptions as to what you can do with a hammer. But every good tool can be used as a weapon. And here's what Hebrews 12, 1 to 2 says. The author writes, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus. Some versions say fixing our eyes on Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith. Now this author is telling us two things that we need to lay aside. Sin, yes, of course, obviously sin, but he also says, and wait. Like sin and wait aren't always the same thing. You might have a wait that's not a sin. Now it can become a sin, but he's telling us to lay aside the sin and the weight. Why? Because there's so many things that may not be sin in our lives, but they are certainly weights. And those weights can very quickly turn into your idol. Those weights can very quickly turn into something that is taking up all of your time, all of your adoration, and they can take your eyes off Jesus, hold you back, make you weary, exhausted. And we get so caught up. We get so caught up in asking, man, is this a sin? can't tell you how many times I've heard somebody say, hey, is it a sin for me to do this, this? And I'm like, well, it's weird, but I guess it's not a sin. Um, <laughs> youth ministry. Um, <laughs> but we get so caught up in asking, is this a sin? Is that a sin? When really, the real question that we have to be asking is not, is this a sin, but does this make me look more like Jesus? Does this thing help me run after Jesus with all of my might? Does this thing draw me closer to the Lord? Does this thing help me witness to others? Does this help me love people more? Does it help me grow in my walk with Christ? Not just is it a sin, but does it help me run after Jesus? And we have so many things in our life that they may not necessarily be sin, but they are adding this unnecessary weight. And listen, I'm not calling anybody out this morning. I don't have anybody in my mind when I say this. But there's nothing wrong with liking sports. But have those sports come between you and God. There's nothing wrong with making money. The Bible doesn't say money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. There's nothing wrong with making money, but do you love it? And have you put it before God? There's nothing wrong with building a reputation but has it compromised your integrity? There's nothing wrong with having a good job, but has it become your idol? There's nothing wrong with phones, TVs, watching movies, but have those things set up strongholds in your life. And listen to me really close. This is where we all get caught up. There's nothing wrong with liking a certain person, a 
certain preacher, a certain politician, but have you put them on a God-sized pedestal? Have you begun to look to them like they are your Messiah? And we don't, here's the deal, we don't, we don't consciously do this. We subconsciously begin to make people our idols, and we begin to look for their approval. We get so caught up in what they think of us, and we idolize their opinion of us, as opposed to what God is speaking over us. So the question is, where does your allegiance lie? Where does your time go? What is your identity? Are you a Bible believe in Jesus, love and born again child of God who also loves sports or who also has a good job? Or are you a sports fanatic who, you know, I, I go to church. I go to church. Are you a businessman or businesswoman? You're like, you know, when I've got time, we go to church. Like, is your identity that you're a child of God or is your faith dependent upon the fact that you spend 90 minutes in a building on Sundays? Because it's so much more than just that. Don't get me wrong, this is an important thing. The Bible says, forsake not the gathering together. But your faith in Jesus is about more than just attending a church service. And the problem doesn't come even when we've missed one Sunday. But the problem comes when we've neglected to make room for Him in our lives. And our characters begin to change. We stop opening our Bible because we're too busy. And man, I get it. We're all busy. We're all busy. But that's why it's so important that we intentionally carve out time for Him in our schedules. Otherwise, those innocent things will very quickly take up the room in our hearts and leave none for the Lord. And that's exactly what these weights, whether innocent or not, do. They take up all the room in our hearts and they leave none for the guest of honor. Matthew 6, 24 Jesus says, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. God will not share your heart with idols. God will not share your heart with idols. And we're filled up with so many good things sometimes, some good things, and we have neglected to make room for the greatest guest. Uh, When me and Natalie moved to Middletown. We lived in Dayton before. We had a house uh, in Dayton. Uh, you know someone's from Dayton when they don't pronounce the T. Uh, it's Dayton. It's not Dayton. Um, it's Dayton. Natalie, when I first met her, said Dayton. And then slowly, as she lived there, she said Dayton. So I knew that it was really getting to her. Uh, that's beside the point. Um, but we moved from Dayton to Middletown. And we, by no means did we have a big house when we were in Dayton. But it was certainly like just a little bit larger. Uh, And then the house we moved into now uh, is just a little bit smaller. I'm blessed. I'm thankful for the house that God gave me. But the fact is, it is a little bit smaller. Our older house had a basement with a lot of storage. uh, had a garage where we could put stuff. Uh, Our new house has a very dungeon-y type basement. I'm scared to death to go down there. Um, I usually will send Natalie if I need something because I'm so terrified of what lurks in the basement. Like I have like panic attacks every time I go down there. Um... But our new house doesn't have so much storage. And so we moved from a a slightly bigger house to a smaller house. Didn't have a garage. And uh, when we got there, you know, we're trying to piece the house together. I remember Seth and Spencer Jackson were helping us move. And we were bringing everything in from the trailer. And we were like, okay, that goes. Let's put that in the living room. Let's put that over in uh, the kitchen. Let's put this in the dining room. And then uh, we have something we didn't know what to do with. And we were like, "I I don't know where to put that. I don't want to put it in the basement because I'm scared to go down there. Um, you know what? Why don't we just put that in the guest bedroom for now? And, uh, and then we'll deal with it later. So that was the first item. And then we were like, every time we didn't know what to do with something, we were like, hey, you know what? Let's just put it in the guest bedroom. And we get done. Man, our house is in, in great order. Like everything's organized. But this guest bedroom... Is, and listen, I'm being very uh, vulnerable right now, so there's no judgment in the house this morning, right? Uh, but everything, and I had to plead with my wife to let me even tell this story, but we are putting all this stuff in the guest bedroom. All this stuff in the guest bedroom. You walk in, there's like stuff all over the floor, nothing's organized. Natalie's saying she's going to go through it. I'm saying I'm going to go through it. Um, we sinned, we lied. Um, and well then, we live there. We're in the house. We're living there in the house. 
So you give us something. Like, oh man, thank you so much. What are we going to do with this? You know what? We could put this in the guest bedroom. So we put it in the guest bedroom. Natalie like goes to the store and buys something and she's like, hey, look at this. I'm like, yeah, pretty cool. What are we going to do with it? She's like, I don't know. I mean, we could put it in the guest bedroom until we figure out what to do with it. Um, and everything was going in the guest bedroom. Not sure what to do with it. We put it in the guest bedroom. Our dog one night, we didn't know what to do with her. We put her in the guest bedroom. Um, we haven't seen her since. Um, but we just kept putting stuff. Just kidding. She's alive and well, we think. Uh, we keep putting her in everything in the guest bedroom. Everything in the guest bedroom. And it gets to this point where it's like, Natalie's like, hey, I'm trying to find this thing. Can you help me find it? And I'm like, well, where do you think it might be? She's like, I think it, <coughs> I think it might be in the guest bedroom. And so now I'm going to this guest bedroom, which isn't big as it is. And I'm like opening the door. It opens in. And so I go to open and it's like, like it just stops like this far in or so. We did everything in our power to make that door open. Again, no judgment in the house this morning. And we would open that, it opened like yay wide. And listen, I have grown in the past few years. That's for certain. Um, Maybe not in the ways that I would like, but I try to fit my body through this door and I'm like getting through well then that's like half the battle that's not even half the battle because you get in the room and you're like and I'm like babe I think like I'm gonna need like an oxygen tank I don't think that the air is breathable up there it's gonna be so thin and so I'm like tracking through this S bedroom I'm like I've got extra oxygen with me I've got snacks like usually whenever I have to get something it's like weeks at a time that I'm gone for and I'm digging through this guest bedroom and I can get to like the general vicinity where I think things, and I'm exaggerating this, okay? It wasn't really that bad. But I'm like getting to the general vicinity of where things are and I'm like, okay, we know it's in here. Let's start digging through the dirt and like trying to wrestle out whatever it is that we need. And, uh, but this is how it was. And now I am happy to say that God has delivered me and we have since then cleaned out that room and uh, God is good. He is a God of restoration and redemption. But here's the deal. What is that room meant for? It's meant for guests. And when we had a guest come to our house, guess where they slept? They slept on the couch. Unless it was Billy, he slept on the floor. Um, Billy's our, our fake son, uh, for those of you who don't know. But when the guests would come, they would sleep on the couch. Why? Because there was no room in the room that was intended for them. It was full of so much junk. And they weren't bad things. They weren't bad things. They were good things. They were things that, man, we could donate and really, really help someone out with. They were not bad. They were good things. But it was filled up with so much junk that there was no room for the guests. And I wonder how many of us have hearts and lives like this? How many of us have so much clutter in our lives? We've gotten into a whole lot of things. Maybe there are things you know you shouldn't be into, or maybe it's a whole lot of things that seemed good in the beginning, and now you've brought those in, all of these different things, and you've begun to fill up your heart, your schedule with all of this stuff. But in the meantime, you have made no room for Jesus. You've made no room for the VIP. No room for the greatest guest. And I don't know what the clutter is in your life this morning, but I encourage you, man, clean it out. Clean it out. Crush the idols. The selfish selfish agendas, the the screen addictions, the the things that we've put over him. We've got to clean those out. And as we do, We're making room for the Holy Spirit to come into our hearts and do His work. To make a home in us. And we say to God, I'm giving you my body, my life to you as a living sacrifice. No longer will it be my life, my glory, but it'll be my life for His glory. And I encourage you this morning to make room in your life for Him. Because more important than any job, any test, any opportunity is sitting at the feet of Jesus. Some of us in here, we're like, man, well, if only I had time, I, 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 would, I would read my Bible. If only I had time, I would, I would pray more. If only I had time, I, I would give or, or, or whatever it is, man. Those things are cop-outs. You have time 
for what you make time for. And the question is not do you have time, but have you prioritized the Lord? Have you carved out the time in your schedule? Have you woken up a few minutes early so that you can spend time in prayer? Have you gone to bed a few minutes late so that you can spend time reading your word? You have time for what you make time for, but you're choosing what is lesser instead of what is better. Or you're doing what culture says we ought to be doing instead of doing what is right and what is necessary. And I believe that there are probably some people in this room this morning, probably some things in your life that need to be pushed back, that need to be pushed back in priority level, things that need to be pushed to number two. And maybe some things just need to be stopped. I don't know what it is for you, but I have a feeling that as you pray and you seek God, He will reveal those things to you if you don't already know what they are. And listen, this exists in all of our lives. The subtle temptation to give our praise and our adoration to things other than God is a daily battle. It is a daily battle. And even as I was preparing this message, man, the Lord was rending my heart. The Lord called me to rend my heart because He was revealing some things in my life that were not bad, but that were taking away time with Him. And if there's anything that I want you to know when you leave this place this morning, if you've zoned out this entire message, there's one thing that I want you to know. And remember, Jesus is the ultimate price. Jesus is the ultimate price. As Colossians 3 says, He is all and He is in all. And as Colossians 1, 15 to 23 says, Jesus, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning. He is the firstborn from the dead, that in everything He might be preeminent. For in Him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. Jesus is what it's all about. Jesus is the prize. The end goal of our lives is eternity with Jesus. And there are so many things in this life that are going to try to get your eyes off of Jesus There are so many things that are going to try to distract you. There are even good things. There are these little foxes that will come in and spoil the whole vineyard. There are little things. There are temptations to be distracted. That's why Paul tells us to fix our eyes on Jesus. Fix our eyes on Jesus. Because what you stare at, what you fixate on, you drift toward. And Paul is saying, fix your eyes on Him. And listen, the greatest joy of heaven, the greatest joy of heaven... It will not be the pearly gates. It will not be the mansions. It will not be the streets of gold. The greatest joy of heaven is going to be being united with Christ for all of eternity. That's the greatest joy. That's it. And we fall into all kinds of idolatry, all kinds of uh, of things that are looking for our adoration. And we're trying to satisfy our flesh. We're looking for this love or this happiness uh, in, in all the wrong places. And we fall into the trap that the enemy has been using since the beginning of time, the bait to take our eyes and our glory off the Creator and fix it onto the creation in an attempt to quench our thirst for satisfaction. Meanwhile, Jesus is saying, I have water of which you will never thirst again. I have water of which you will never thirst again. Some of you this morning may have walked in here and been going through seasons where you have been very dissatisfied in your walk with Christ. And I might argue that it's because you've based your faith on the benefits that Christ offers as opposed to Christ himself. You've fixed your eyes on the blessings that fade. You've sought the gifts over the gift giver and you've forgotten the prize. Is God a healer? Yes, God is a healer. I believe that God healed some people in this altar just this morning. Does God provide? Yes, God is a God of provision. But we have to remember that these are the benefits of him. 
They aren't the grand prize. The grand prize is Christ. And know this, the money that God has allowed you to have, one day you're going to run out of it, and one day it's going to be worth absolutely nothing. The reputation that you've built, one day people will forget about completely. The house that God has given you will one day be complete rubble. And I say this with a humble heart, but God may even have healed your body, but one day we will all die. The Bible says it's appointed unto a man once to die. And these are all good things, and these are even things that we seek and we pray for. But we have to remember who it's all about. Jesus is the light. Jesus is the prize. Jesus is life. He's the joy. He's the peace. He is our wonderful counselor, our mighty God, our prince of peace, our everlasting father, and he is all you need. Do we pray for healing? Yes, we pray for healing. We seek God for healing. Do we pray for provision? Yes. Do we pray for blessings? Yes, we pray for blessings, but we, meanwhile, we remember that he is the ultimate prize, and we have to set our minds this way because then when you pray for something and God doesn't answer it the way that you thought he would have or thought he should have, you're going to remember Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. I'm going to be walking through this sickness right now. I'm going to pray for healing, but I'm going to remember Jesus is enough. I might be struggling in these battles, but I'm going to remember right now that Jesus is enough. My grace is sufficient for you. Jesus is enough. And Jesus does not say, you're never going to have a bad day. Jesus actually says the opposite. He says, in this world, you will have troubles, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. And then he says later in Matthew, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Listen, following Jesus is not about what it can get you, but it's about who it can get you. It's about who lives inside and does a work in our hearts. And he is worthy. He is worthy of our praise for all of eternity. And we don't worship him just to receive a blessing, but we worship him because of the blessings that he's already given us. We worship as a response to what he's already given us. Stand up on your feet with me. Listen, there is a very real God. He's very present. And he made you on purpose for a purpose, intentionally. You might have been a mistake to your parents, but you were no mistake to God. And he created you to be in relationship with him for all of eternity. And he made you for worship. And he will not share your heart with idols. So what are we going to do? We're going to crush the idols. Maybe you didn't walk in here with anything that you've been giving your time and your adoration to. Maybe, man, you are in a great place this morning. Praise God for that. Well, then I want to remind you to stay guarded. Because the temptation to idle after the things of this world exists daily. And every day things will be fighting for your attention, fighting for your worship. And we have to stay on guard and remember who is worthy of it. We're going to crush the idols. We're going to remove the clutter. Those things that may not be bad. And listen, I'm not saying, hey, go get rid of your kids and your wife. That's not what I'm, I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. But when Christ comes first in your life, you can love your wife, your husband, and your kids so much better. When Christ comes first, you can love your wife like Christ loved the church. When Christ come first, comes first, you can love all the most important people in your life all the much, all the more better. So we're going to make room. We're going to prioritize things. We're going to carve out time for him, not just for 90 minutes on a Sunday morning, but every day of our life. Because walking with Jesus is a daily thing. It's not meant to just be done once a week. And we're going to live our lives not for our glory, but for his. No longer will it be my life, my glory, but it will be my life for his glory. The scripture we open with this morning, uh, very real, very true. It's something we don't talk about a lot, and that is that and God's wrath will be poured out on all unrighteousness. That's Bible. That's scripture. We believe that. There's coming a day of judgment. And God will 
pay to each what they deserve. And we can disagree as far as what the reprobate mind is, but one thing that we can agree upon this morning is that each and every one of us is or has been the unrighteous. Each and every one of us have been the ungodly. Romans says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We can agree that each and every one of us have gone after idols, that each and every one of us have given our adoration, our time to the things that don't deserve it. We've, we've spent time doing these things that we know God's word condemns. And we've gone after all the wrong things. And according to God's word, makes us deserving of wrath. This is truth. This is the word of God. But here's the beauty of the cross that we find in Romans 5. It says, for while we were still weak, verse 6, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore... We have now been justified by his blood. Much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. This is the gospel. This is it. And we've talked about it before, but Christianity is more than just behavior modification. And you don't get right to come to Jesus. You come to Jesus and then he makes you right. And listen, you may have walked in here this morning, whether you're a saint, whether you're a Christian or not, you may have walked in here this morning with some things that are weighing you down. Some things that have gotten way too much of your time and your adoration. You may have walked in here with some shame that's following you from some things that you've done in your past. Each and every one of us have gone after idols. But what I want you to know this morning is that it is not too late for you. You walked in here, you don't have Jesus in your heart, and you think, man, God can never love me, God can never forgive me, man. It's not too late because God showed us his love that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that shame that you walked in here with, that identity that you walked in here with, no longer has to be your identity, but you can become a child of God this morning. God loved you so much that he made a way despite your sins, and it's not too late. But listen to me closely. There is coming a time where it will be. The train is leaving, and are you going to get on or are you going to let it go? There's coming a time where it's going to be too late. But if this morning, man, you put your faith and your trust in Jesus, man, he will make you new. And you will be on course to spend eternity with him. And through the blood of Jesus, there is grace, even for those that have gone after idols. He desires a relationship with you. Are you going to respond to that or are you going to let it slip? So now with every head bowed and every eye closed, nobody's looking around. I want to ask you this question. Well, first I want to tell you a story. The word says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Each and every one of us have done things that we should not do. We've gone after idols. And we've done things deserving of death, according to the law. But 2,000 years ago, God sent his son to live a perfect life and to die on a cross that we deserved, to take on the full wrath of God and pay the debt for our sin. But then he didn't stay dead. No, three days later, he was raised to life again. And in the same way, through him, you can be raised to new life this morning. You can be raised to new life this morning. So if you're in this room, and you say, Pastor Luke, I want to make a decision right now to follow Jesus. I want to make a decision to welcome him into my heart, either for the first time or for the first time in a long time. If that's you this morning, with every head bowed, every eye closed, I want you to slip your hand up right now. If that's you. 
Amen. Amen. Anybody else? If that's you. Amen. Amen. And God sees those hands. God sees those hands. This is what we're going to do. We're going to pray this prayer. And I don't know your story. I don't know what you've walked in here with. But I know that God can make you new right now this morning. And this prayer is not some magic formula. But if you say these words and you mean these words and they come from your heart, then you will be saved. God's word says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. So church, help us out. Repeat after me. Dear Jesus, I recognize that I'm a sinner. I recognize that I need you. Now I'm asking that you would come into my life Change me from the inside out. I believe that you died for me. And I believe God rose you from the dead. Now I'm confessing you with my mouth. I'm turning from my sin. I receive you as my Savior. And I receive you as my Lord. Now make me new. In Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Can we celebrate those who made that decision this morning? Amen. Man, heaven is going crazy right now over those who gave their hearts to Jesus this morning. And we're so excited as a church. If that was you, if you lifted your hand up, man, we want to invite you. We've got a team out, at, out these back doors here who've got some baskets for you. Not baskets, but little goodie bags. Bags for you. They don't have baskets, sorry. Um, there's some information in there, and we would love, 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 love the opportunity to come alongside you in this new journey that you're on. I want to change gears here real quick. This is what I want to do. I believe that there are some people who walked in here this morning with some weight. I believe there are some people who walked in here, and if you're brave enough to say, you might say you walked in here with some idols with some things that you've been given way too much of your time and your adoration to. This is what I want to encourage you to do. I'm going to pray in just a moment. And when I get done praying, I want to invite you to come to this altar. And I think this is something that we can all do. Because I think we all wrestle with this day after day. This temptation to follow after these things that do not honor God. We're depraved. And I want to encourage you to get out of your seats and find a place in this altar. And our prayer team, our our pastors, our altar team are going to come around and begin to pray over you, pray with you and encourage, uh, stand together with you in prayer. But I want you to find a place in this altar alone. And I challenge you to take that weight, take that idol, that sin. Maybe it's a sin, maybe it may not be considered a sin. Maybe it's just something that's taken up way too much of your time. I challenge you to give that to the Lord this morning and welcome him to sit on the throne of your heart. Welcome him to sit on the throne of your life. No longer will it be my life, my glory, but it will be my life for his glory. Lord, we love you. We praise you, God. We thank you, God, for giving us this time together, Lord, to dig into your word. God, we thank you, God, that though we have gone astray, Lord, you have made a way, God, for us to be reconciled to you. God, you have made a way for us to be redeemed through the blood of Jesus. And I pray that right now, Lord, that these things, these weights that are holding down even the saints, Lord, that you would give them the courage, the boldness, the wisdom, Lord, right now to lay them before your feet. Lord, that they would be challenged by this, Lord. And that whatever it is in their lives, Lord, whatever it is that's in their hearts, God, that has separated them from you, God, that right now, in the name of Jesus, you'd soften their hearts and give them the strength to lay it down. God, we praise you and we thank you for it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Go ahead and begin to make your way out of your seats. If that's you, man, there is no shame in this. And we're going to begin to come along and pray over you.